Welcome. I'm Lloyd Miner, Dean of Medicine at Stanford, and I'm delighted to be with you for a special Stanford Med Live. Now, we expect Stanford graduates to reach new heights, but Stanford Medicine alumna Kate Rubens has taken that to another level. She joins us today while orbiting the Earth on the International Space Station. In 2016, on her first mission on the ISS, Dr. Rubens became the first person to sequence DNA in space. In 2016, and again on this mission, she has researched microgravity's effects on the heart. In partnership with a team on the ground led by Joseph Wu, director of Stanford's Cardiovascular Institute. The project was fittingly dubbed the Cardinal Heart Study. Like Dr. Rubens, we here at Stanford, especially our students, are on journeys of discovery. I hope you find Dr. Rubens' insights helpful as you consider your passions and career goals. Without further ado, I'll welcome Dr. Rubens and Stanford Professor of Medicine and of Microbiology and Immunology, Dr. David Relman, who will lead today's discussion. David? Thank you, Dean Miner. It's my great pleasure and honor to help host this live event with Kate at the International Space Station and with the Stanford community. Um, Kate, I've told you this before, but I most love being able to say, greetings from Earth. Um, we have- Greetings uh, from space, greetings from the International Space Station. We have about 28 minutes um, in which to talk um, we're, with an interruption of about a minute at about 20 minutes past the hour. So um, needless to say, I don't wanna use up more time than absolutely necessary for a proper introduction. Um, but I did wanna make just a few very brief remarks. Kate was raised in Napa, California, attended UC San Diego as an undergraduate, and then did her PhD doctoral work here at Stanford between 1999 and 2006. Although Kate was a member of the cancer biology program, her interests were in viral host interactions and Pat Brown and I became her co-mentors. Kate studied smallpox and Ebola and spent many of her graduate student days literally working in a spacesuit at the BL4 suite at CDC in Atlanta. She was fearless, curious, persistent, productive, upbeat, and amazingly dedicated to science. Following graduation, Kate became a Whitehead Fellow at MIT, but two years later, decided to submit an application when NASA issued a call for new members of the astronaut program. And the rest is history. She was selected in 2009 and became the 60th woman in space when she launched on a Soyuz rocket in July, 2016. Her current mission began on October 14th and is scheduled to end next month. Um, and I should just add, Kate, uh, just uh, a week or so ago, completed her second spacewalk of this mission. And for those who are interested, the video feed is truly amazing. And it's available um, if you just search uh, Spacewalk and NASA TV Live. So um, first, Kate, how has this mission been so far and how does it compare to your uh, first mission? Thanks, David. It's great to talk to you. It's, uh, this has been an incredible mission. Um, I'm not sure I was expecting the pace up here. Uh, it's it's it was busy and it was full in 2016, um, but the number of scientific experiments seems to just have absolutely exploded. Part of that is our capabilities in terms of uh, being able to have cargo up mass and down mass regularly. We've also really expanded our powered payload capability so we can send things uh, frozen, we can send things at minus 80 degrees, we can send cells live uh, back and forth to the earth. And that's really expanded our biological capabilities. We also have a lot of material science payloads and physics payloads that have been installed since the last time I was here. So it's been pretty nonstop, uh, but it's been incredibly exciting to just see the sheer number of experiments going on at any given time. 
can you um, talk a little bit about what you think are some of the most important ongoing experiments um, and, and maybe some of the more surprising or gratifying findings that have um, come from them? Yeah, it's, it's hard to pick because we are really, we're doing hundreds of experiments simultaneously. I'm, I'm quite impressed by some of the fundamental physics experiments up here. It's, it's not my area, so I, I get into trouble very quickly when I start talking about particle physics. Um, but Cold Atom Lab is, I think, going to be a really wonderful facility for future experimentation. Um, and that's starting to yield some great results. We are doing a lot biologically. I, I do think the Cardinal Heart experiment was one of the most interesting. Part of that is we are able, we're looking at the cells with microscopy. We're really seeing what's going on with these cells. When we start to do these complex experiments that have a lot of different cell types in them and we're building up tissue architecture to be bigger, I think we're going to see more and more profoundly the effects of microgravity. We can see that already even in a thin monolayers because the cells are suspended by uh, adhering to the cell culture dish. But when we get these larger tissue structures, uh, those are some of the more interesting uh, results up here. I think we're going to continue to build on that. I'm really looking forward to seeing in future missions some of the bioprinting that we're doing up here. And I did get to do uh, the experiment that I've been talking about for 10 years, which is about 800, close to 1,000 swabs of the International Space Station for a thorough microbial sampling. Um, I can only imagine that, that some of those results may be things that some folks wish they didn't know. But, um, but I think you and I both appreciate that, and I know others do as well, that this kind of information is pretty important for the long-term space exploration mission. And, and so maybe could you talk a little bit about how the science you're doing now plays into that particular future um, purpose? Yeah, some of the science that we're doing is is really understanding uh, our life support systems. We have our life support systems on board the International Space Station, um, but we talked a little bit about reliability of life support systems earlier and understanding how those are going to work and function really as we go into deep space is incredibly important. I think a thorough microbial understanding, right now we use iodine in the water, um, but a better genomic understanding of what's in our water system. Our water system is over 90% uh, closed loop water system. So we don't ship water up from the planet at this point. We recycle. Uh, so, so yesterday's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. And uh, you can imagine that's quite a challenge when you have such a closed loop water system. Some of the engineering we're doing is bringing, is closing that loop even further. So we just have installed this mission, a few pieces of equipment uh, to, to make this even further of a closed loop uh, of the water system. And I think there's a lot that we're going to find out um, about how humans can, can survive in such a closed loop, things that we really haven't done before. Got it. Um, I'll just say that yesterday's coffee is, is also tomorrow's coffee here as well. Um, but just it hasn't gone through the particular path that you're talking about. Um, could you mention a little bit about the DNA sequencing technology? For those who don't know, you were the first to sequence DNA in space. And although it might seem like simply a technical feat, it does have a, an important purpose. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that project was really interesting. And it did start out as a, as a technical demonstration. We asked the question, will sequencing technology work up here? Um, previous types of sequencers, the, the larger ones, things that are sitting on your lab bench or sequencers that, that take up a bigger footprint and sequencers that have, uh, you know, lasers and fluorescence readouts just are not very compatible with spaceflight because of the footprint of the equipment and the sensitivity of the lasers to things like launch loads and vibration. So we asked, hey, can we use nanopore sequencing up here? We thought our biggest challenge was going to be fluidics, um, but it actually wasn't. We did not have uh, the fluidics problems that we thought we were going to, probably because of the um, really the small amount of liquid. It, it started out as a, can we do it? And then once we demonstrated that we can, uh, now we're moving on to showing, we've shown that we can go from a swab directly all the way through sequencing readouts. Um, some things I did just a few months ago, we're looking at multiplex sequencing. I, 
we're now going to do uh, time courses of, of space station uh, evolution of microbes up here. It just opens up this whole opportunity to answer questions. It, sequencing is a tool, and so we can do experiments that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do because we can do them at point of care right up here at the space station. We can, we can use this to answer questions versus waiting three months to send samples back to Earth. You mentioned um, some of the, the practical problems of doing science up there. Um, we had a number of questions that were submitted to the, to the dean's office, to the school, and they've been compiled. And one of those questions um, dealt with this very issue. It, it, this person asks, what mundane lab tasks on Earth become significantly more difficult in a microgravity environment? It, that is a great question. It's not one I'm sure I really fully appreciated until I was up here and, and everything's floating. Um, it, nothing is tacked down on your lab bench. You can't just put something somewhere. So it's re it, it goes really mundane, like you have to put Velcro on every single piece of equipment. Pipettes and pipette tips actually were a, a very hard thing to deal with. In 2016, I did a lot of work with pipetting to demonstrate that we could do it in space. Um, but we hadn't quite solved pipette tips yet, and so we were still pulling them off the pipetter individually and then sticking them in a plastic bag, and they would float out of the bag. Uh, we finally realized not that long ago that you can use a, a sharps container with a very narrow opening and inject the pipette tip into it, and it'll float around, but it'll mostly stay contained in the container. It, it, it's, it's some really simple things that make science very hard up here. Um, cell culture and changing the media on cell culture is, I think, going to be our next challenge. We've done some work with that, but uh, there's certainly a lot to go. Got it. Um, I know that, um, that you've, uh, you've talked about the difficulties of just working in the space provided, and I gather you have less lab bench space now than you did in CCSR. Um, can you talk about how you, you know, have to deal with ad hoc problems and unforeseen issues that you just have to solve the best way you can? Yeah, it's a strange environment up here. Um, all there's stuff on all four walls. There's a there's cables that come out of all four walls, and there's not really a bench space per se. We do have some modular work areas that that we can deploy, and that those act as kind of a bench. Um, it, it sometimes opens up things. You can stick something on the ceiling. Uh, you just have to remember exactly where you put it. This is this is another challenge up here. And so we, we utilize the space pretty well up here, but, but space in, in three dimensions gets a little bit different. Um, so I was working on something today. You do get access to things in a different way. So you can float behind racks. Um, you know, you can flip upside down. You can look at your experiment a different way than you might do uh, you can imagine on the earth. And so there are some things where space is your advantage up here, but uh, there's also things where everything floating in the three dimensionality can, can cause you some problems. Can imagine. Um, I wanted to ask you just a few things about um, the, sort of the personal experience of being up there. Uh, as you may have heard, we still have a pandemic down here on earth. And um, needless to say, it's created a great deal of suffering and a lot of um, difficult challenges, not the least of which is um, the problem of severe social isolation. You may be one of the best people to ask um, for advice about how one might deal with the challenges of, of social isolation. You have thoughts you can offer? Yeah, I, I was on Earth for a while during the pandemic and I think experienced that along with everybody else. It is it is really hard. I, I am not sure that, and I, and I thought about pandemics a lot. I, I did biodefense research and thought about smallpox and Ebola for many years of my life, but I'm not sure I considered the social factors and how challenging that would be for human beings. We're social and we like to interact. I think up here, um, you just make your world really small. So you have what you have, and the station is a small environment, but it doesn't feel confining. Um, we have a lot of tools that we use to stay in touch with our friends and our families. Um, we have VOIP, so we can we can actually call people. Um, we do have, once a week, we're allowed to have a video chat. That's pretty important. 
Uh, I know a lot of people have been staying in touch with with uh, their phones and in laptops and computers and video calls. And it's not the same as face to face interaction, but it does a lot for you. It's one of those things that I, even if I'm having a tough day, and things are going not so great up here, and I don't necessarily want to take the time to have a phone call or a video call, that is really important. And so I, I think my best advice is when you're in a, a an isolated environment and you're away from, away from humans, even if you're not feeling it, uh, to go ahead and make that contact, you're going to feel better afterwards. It's kind of like exercise. You may not be totally up for it, but you never have an exercise session and go, hey, that was a bad idea. I regret it now. It just takes a little activation energy. You you do have colleagues up there, and and they of course come from different kinds of communities and backgrounds. Have you learned um, from them about how um, to sort of adjust to new circumstances and and deal with adversity in ways other than your own? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we this is the International Space Station. We have an international group up here. So you're dealing with with uh, people who live in very different cultures. But in addition to that, we have our own subcultures that we come from. So we come from civilian or military. Um, we come from scientific backgrounds or test pilot backgrounds or engineering backgrounds. And I think that has uh, just as much of an influence as your as your uh, country of origin. Sometimes, what we find up here is that. We are we're pretty bonded as a crew because we're in it together. Um, I do think this is something that people are finding in the pandemic, where you uh, can reach out with this shared experience, even if you're coming from a completely different point of view. We learn a lot from each other because wherever our backgrounds are, we've ended up at the same place. And our place is uh, an incredible and a wonderful laboratory, but it's also a dangerous place. Um, we think about that. We depend on each other for safety, and that that does a lot uh, to understand another person's experience and to see how they deal with challenges and adversity. To know that they're your teammate, they're in it with you. Um, you're going to depend on them to pull you out of a fire or close a hatch during a rapid depress. Yeah. Um, we have about two plus minutes before this satellite handover. Um, there were a number of questions from a number of students here who were interested in your reflections, looking back at your time as a student. What what of those experiences now seem most valuable to you in, in the career path you chose? I think I'm really glad that I got in the lab early. Uh, so I was interested in HIV in, in high school and I did public outreach and, and HIV education, peer-to-peer -peer and awareness, and um, started working in an HIV laboratory pretty early in undergraduate. And I think that was an incredibly valuable experience. Uh, coursework is, is amazing, and of course lab classes are really, you know, that builds your foundation. But working in a laboratory at an early age, I think, um, was probably the it was the most exciting thing I'd ever done, and it's it's really what set me down the path of uh, I want to do this. I want to do science for the rest of my life. I did not really have an assumption that this was where I was going to be doing it, but uh, I knew that I wanted to do science and I wanted to do laboratory science. You've made um, doing the kind of science you do now very appealing, I think, to a lot of us. Is there anything in particular you'd recommend to those who hope to follow in your path? Yeah, I think for people that are interested in space science, I would say pursue it. Look for funding opportunities. Um, you know, NASA has some, you just go to the NASA website. They have, there's a couple different paths to get funded, uh, some through NASA, th some through spaces, th cases. There's a uh, uh, Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. There's also international efforts. I would say pursue it. I, if you have a good idea to fly in space, go for it. It might take a lot of ground testing, and it may be a longer um path to getting your experiment flown than you would expect for a, a normal PhD or a postdoc, but but find an avenue and start working on it. There's a, there's a lot of really great stuff to do up here, and, and we welcome uh, ideas and people's experiments that they want to do. We're going to start writing them down, and I think we're going to have this little minute interruption in about a second. So we'll talk to you momentarily.
for those who are, are waiting here, um, this break has to do with the fact that the International Space Station is moving at about 18,000 miles an hour, and it periodically loses direct radio and telecommunications contact with a satellite to downlink the signal. So it's now searching for the next satellite link. And once that gets established, we get reconnected again. Um, one of the most amazing things is that the greatest distance between um, Kate and the space station and us is not so much the nautical miles above Earth, it's the speed at which they're traveling. Um, and that's, that's really what sort of most separates her from, from us right now, along with the other conditions like microgravity. Um, I'll ask her about this spacewalk, but I do encourage all of you to, um, to search for NASA TV Live and um, the spacewalks that Kate just completed. Um, it's a lot of live feed, but um, it's, it's really amazing to watch. It's got the live audio and video, including webcam video from her helmet. So you can see exactly what uh, she was doing at the time. I think we may be back now. Are you there, Kate? I am. Got you back after the satellite handover. Great. Um, I was just uh, talking a little bit about these incredible spacewalks. Can you just say a little bit about what that experience is like being outside? Yeah, it is. It's quite a thing. We we train for it, you know, five ten years. Uh, we train underwater in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory, which is a, a giant swimming pool at NASA, which has um, station reconstruction underwater. And we do train in the real spacesuits. Um, but one of the interesting things is we don't train a lot at vacuum. And so that's that. You know, when I'm doing spacewalks, that's one of the things that I notice. Uh, we go from about 14.7 psi is our normal atmosphere uh, down to all, all the way down to 4.2. This this is a, a really complicated protocol so that we don't have decompression sickness. It actually takes us. We're in the suits about 11, 12 hours. It takes us four or five hours before we even go out the door. Uh, you notice some things out the door that you don't notice when you're at normal atmosphere. Um, your voice changes. Uh, there's less air molecules to go across your vocal cords. Um, you can just taste the thinness of the atmosphere is the best way that I can describe it. And you are in your own spacecraft. Um, so you're, you're certainly very vigilant about the amount of air uh, you have, about the oxygen supply. Um, you're, you're cooling. You're thermally cooled by a sublimator. You're thinking about all those things, and then you've got also about 70 or 80 different tools that all have to stay tethered, and of course, the big project of the day. Um, our big project this last time was to build a base structure for this, these new solar arrays that are coming up to the space station. And uh, it, it took about two EVAs. We had some tricky bolts, but we built them. The, it, they're they're eight feet tall bags to bring out and the structures are, are 20, 30 feet tall. They were 300 pounds. Um, so that it was quite a thing. But the cool thing is you can actually see them. These windows behind me point towards the P6 structure uh, at the edge of the space station. And so after I came back in, I could look at them. I was a little nervous when I f saw that. I was like, oh no, I hope I put all the MLI on nicely and you stuck these things out on space station. They're going to be here for a while. So I I hope I did a good job. I got a camera out and I took a long lens and made sure that it was up to my level of satisfaction. <laughs> I have to say from, from watching, it was, it was really amazing. Um, you seemed um, immensely successful. The one thing that concerned me was what appeared to be a little puncture uh, wound in the outer layer of your fingertip. It, does, does this happen um, with some regularity and, and, how can that be, I guess, is what I'm wondering. Yeah, it does happen. We, we've had it happen before. We've had cut gloves. It's one of the things that we certainly worry about and we really pay attention to. Um, you're using your hands to grip metallic surfaces, and the outside of the space station is pretty pockmarked with um, micrometeoroid debris. So there's sharp edges, um, and there's there's material. So you're, you're very careful about where you put your hands. Um, but we, this is one of the reasons that we do these glove inspections is you want to always catch something uh, and identify it before it becomes a problem. And uh, you, we've got 
suit pressure sensors on the on the suit and we have backup oxygen supply so we can deal with these kinds of problems but it's part of our inspection process um, to make sure that we are checking regularly for even uh, small punctures and do an assessment of how deep those punctures go in the gloves but yeah we we, we certainly do see glove damage um, that's that's part of EVA uh, you know we also uh, David like you said you get to see uh, everything in this new high definition camera and I, I hope folks get a chance to take a look at what the planet looks like on a spacewalk um, being at the edge of the space station flying over the world is is a pretty incredible experience and I think we finally get to share that with everybody with this this new high definition camera it's pretty incredible views yeah that it is um, one maybe last or next to last thing I wanted to ask you, um, it, it has been announced that you are on the short list for being selected as the first woman to walk on the moon, which is a pretty amazing thing. Um, your thoughts about, about this? Yeah, so I've been selected to be on the Artemis team, uh, which is which is 18 astronauts at NASA. Um, I'm I'm just pretty excited about joining this team, and so I think we're not really so worried right now about who's going to be uh, on specific missions. Uh, but this team is going to be working on a lot of our lunar infrastructure going forward. Um, I'm pretty excited. That means I'm going to have an awesome post-flight job. I'm hoping to work some on our next generation of spacesuits. Uh, we've we also have. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work on our heavy lift uh, rocket, our Orion capsule. Um, we're, we're working right now through lander systems and also uh, Gateway, which is, uh, is going to orbit the lunar surface and has a lot of science potential. So I, I'm really excited to, to continue some of the biological work that we're doing on the International Space Station. But this is a neat team to be on. And uh, there's, this is just an inflection point in terms of the kinds of things that are going on at, at NASA since I've been here. So being on the Artemis team and, and getting a chance to work on a lunar program, uh, that's the once in a lifetime opportunity for me. What, what's the current um, expected timeline for, for a first or a return to the moon surface? Oh, David, it's I'm trying to get through my landing date here. <laughs> it's uh, we <laughs> that's so far future. Uh, no, we we have a, an incredibly exciting and, and a robust program and uh, we're look for mid 2020s. Um, we actually are if, if folks are interested in following this, um, we've got SLS testing and we're going to have Artemis one, which is the uncrewed. Uh, test flight uh, that should be coming up in a few years and it's going to be really exciting to watch. Great. Um, so we have about two minutes or a little bit less. Um, first of all, if you are offered the opportunity to stay up there beyond the April um, return plan return date, um, would you would you be a yes or a no? Do you want back or do you want to stay? Oh, I'd be a yes, and I've sent a few emails to the program managers, but I keep getting told I have to get in the Soyuz and come home on April 16th, 17th. So <laughs> I've I've gotten a hard no. I keep asking though. Maybe we'll turn that into a into a possibly. No, I it, it's it's been a really good mission, and I am looking forward to coming back to the planet. But uh, time and space is incredibly special. I'm enjoying every moment of it. Yeah, it it certainly seems that way to us down here. Um, we have less than a minute. I just want to thank you for um, spending time with us. Thank you for um, for you know connecting back to the Stanford community. I think your presence doing this means a lot to people. We certainly would love to have you come back in person, um, especially when we're not you know having to distance like we are now. And I mean not just today, but in general. Um, but it's, it's really inspirational. So thank you for all of that. I also want to thank the NASA Astronaut Office for helping make this possible, as well as the Stanford Dean's Office. Um, last closing thought. I guess that was the last closing thought. Um, thank you all for attending this, um, this event. And please feel free to send in thoughts or questions. Be happy to try to relay them to Kate and, um, and add to this conversation. 
So thank you all. <laughs>